very much, Melissa. My name is uh, Manu Steven, and I'm the CEO and founder of Inventor, where we are building a credit score for your inventions. Uh, now, before I start, before I talk about Inventor, I want to talk about myself a little bit and my background. Um, I used to work in research at WashU. Uh, I started working with the Department of Neurosurgery, uh, and I was fortunate to work on some really cool projects, uh, including helping build the world's first dissolvable brain sensor. Uh, which was then published in Nature, featured on CNN and so forth. So it was really exciting to be a part of, of projects like this uh, and learning how to build medical devices, but ultimately I learned how difficult it was to actually protect an invention. Uh, and that's really how Inventure came about. Um, but it's not just universities that go through that, uh, it's a lot of companies. But protecting inventions with intellectual property is incredibly important for small and medium businesses, especially startups. Uh, being able to actually protect that invention can give you a 35x greater increase in funding and employee growth for startups. And oftentimes, when you're an IP-intensive startup, and by that I mean think like biotech, med device, hardware, these companies that really need to uh, protect their inventions early on, oftentimes that IP is worth at least 80% of your business value from the start. But deciding on which inventions you actually protect is incredibly costly and time intensive And that's where Inventor comes in. Inventor helps companies decide which inventions to protect. Uh, so we allow companies to make faster and smarter decisions and allow them to focus on the inventions that can actually move forward. The way we do that is with a web app that screens inventions with an AI-driven and human-verified score report. So what that means is we uh, do a three-step process, which I'll get into here in a second, of submission and then verification and score report. So with the submission, we take a really simple one-sentence description of, of what that invention is. So let's say you're talking to Thomas Edison, uh, and he says, well, I'm working on a light bulb. Okay, great. Well, the next thing we do is we actually do a really quick call with the inventor, because oftentimes there can be an error in translation. What an inventor thinks is patentable isn't always exactly what actually is patentable. So maybe we learn from uh, Thomas Edison that, well, it's not exactly light bulb, what you're doing is you're using electricity to heat a thin filament that produces light. And so we're able to translate that invention, uh, and within 24 hours, you get your score and report uh, of prior art. So there's a lot of companies that definitely need this kind of help. In fact, uh, the small business agency, the SBA, uh, has put out a report recently that said there are 300,000 businesses of uh, of small business category that are filing at least four patents every year. And so with that, that's the real target market we're going after initially, are these small, medium-sized businesses that are really cash-strapped, resource-strapped, uh, and that market is about 900 million. And of course, from there, we'll be expanding to larger enterprises. So think about you know the Boeings, the Googles, the IBMs that are filing thousands of patents annually. Those are who we'll look to help. So just as a, a little overview of uh, what we've done so far, this, this whole business model really came to light in probably October of, of this past year. Um, by December, we actually established a partnership with the USPTO, or the US Patent and Trademark Office. So what we do with them is we help their patent pro bono program. So we help underserved inventors uh, bring their inventions to life by using our SCORE report. So we're partnering with the USPTO to do that. We're very excited about that. Uh, in January of this past year, uh, late January, we launched a beta. By March, we had customers on board. So we're very excited about our traction so far. And here are some of our uh, customers already. Um, so we're, we're excited to be helping companies and, and law firms in St. Louis and beyond St. Louis, um, and uh, as well as our partnerships with the USPTO. So we are excited to continue to grow and uh, continue to gain traction. We've got a great team moving this forward. Uh, aside from myself, uh, our tech co-founder, Eric, uh, used to work at Allscripts where he worked on a stealth spin-out. Uh, he built a recommendation engine uh, for Allscripts where they would help physicians uh, in looking based on uh, patient charts, make recommendations on what types of medications they might need. So he helped build that at Allscripts. Uh, and then our strategic, strategic advisor, excuse me, Donish, who's been fantastic. He helped co-found Schoology, which went on to raise 53 million. Uh, he's been a fantastic advisor for us, and other advisors include Bob Welsh, former chief of in-house counsel at Energizer, Mark Showers, who was CIO at Monsanto, Kirk Damon, who is uh, an attorney at a patent attorney at Lewis Rice, and uh, also sits on the National USPTO Council. 
So I know uh, part of this presentation is really what we need help with. The biggest thing is we'd love to continue finding more customers. So if you know startups that are in this IP intensive space, whether it be biotech or med device or aerospace, we've talked to a whole host of companies. Anyone that you think might be relevant, please send them our way. Uh, secondly, we'll be looking to make uh, a stronger marketing approach. And so if you know of a marketing genius as we start building campaigns out, we would absolutely love your help with that as well. And of course it goes without saying, of course we need to raise money, but we all know that anyway. So my name is Monday Steven, I'm founder of Inventor. Thank you very much. Hey, who wants to kick it off? I will if nobody else will. Oh, no. As soon as I think I will, everyone's like, no, no, no. Who's can be first? Are you going to, can you discuss anything that's under the hood? In other words, how are you validating it based on, I mean, are you just taking tests from previous inventions and doing a score on it and determining, you know, does it match up with how well that company was evaluated or how are yeah, you about Yeah, that? that's, that's a great question. Um, so as we were building the back end, we were constantly kind of testing it out with customers. The way we got our very first customer, uh, Louis Rice, uh, which is a law firm here in St. Louis, was through that process. Uh, and so when we had built only the back end, there was no front end to it, it looked hideous and awful. Uh, we went and tested it with them. Uh, and one of the attorneys was like, well, let's see if you can find a patent that I wrote. Uh, and so that was the first stress test that he used. And so we found it. The way the process works internally too is we show you little relevant snippets of relevant prior art that exists and it's this kind of quick user journey. And so we show you four pieces at a time, you pick what's relevant uh, and it learns from that and then we show you a new four. And so uh, we went through that process with him, we showed him four, we picked a couple that were relevant and on the next screen was his path. Um, and so he was pretty excited about how quickly we found that and we were able to sign a customer contract. Okay. Thanks for your presentation, Ryan. Um, I might have missed this, but I, my question is, do you also provide consultant for companies that are not sure if they need a patent or not? Yeah, so we are not attorneys ourselves, so we do not provide legal expertise at all. So we don't ever provide an opinion on can I patent this or not. And oftentimes, even really an attorney can't either. Ultimately, it's up to the USPTO when they accept or reject that application. Um, but that being said, we are starting to work with law firms as channel partners. So as part of a next step, we're able to have a referral or strategic partnership with these law firms where they're able to take these reports and talk to attorneys who can then help in IP strategy uh, and, and focus on that question. So we don't really do the consulting ourselves, but we're starting to form channel partnerships to do that. Um. Maybe you maybe you express this. I'm going to sit. You know, a, how do you get paid? And B, do you see going directly to the you know to the, the inventors as your market, or do you see you know, law firms, consultants, those sort of people, venture capital people, are they more your clients? Yeah. So companies are definitely more of our clients. So uh, SMEs, startups are definitely uh, the folks that we're talking to. Not so much individual inventors. Um, law firms. We started getting traction from, but it's it's a long sales cycle. They are tough to convert, they can be risk averse, uh, and ultimately, smaller companies move much faster in the sales cycle process, they're quick to make decisions. In terms of how we get paid, um, there's a couple options that we use. One, right now, we're doing kind of a per report basis, just to really make sure that we're validating the revenue that we're getting, that companies like the reports, they're coming back, so we're testing metrics of, uh, how much? How many reports are we getting? So, for example, uh, recently we've been experiencing 70% week-over-week growth of number of reports bought. Um, but we also want to make sure that with the companies that we do have, within the companies they're getting more reports as well, right? So we want to make sure it's not just one company gets a report and they never come back to us. So those are metrics that we're testing. Um, and we're, we'll soon be um, launching an additional platform uh, that will make it easier for a subscription service. So we'll be transitioning to that, but we want to make sure we're continuing to prove out our, our core technology of these reports. Sometimes after an application goes in, you get back um, feedback from other countries or whatever, and along with an article that says, you know, you know, it's nothing different than what was, you know, written in the past, you know, ten years ago or so. Does your company do anything to compare the validity of the the fit between 
your patent and what was previously, if it didn't show up, let's say, in your first round, what's the probability that that really is related to your patent? Yeah, so uh, I just want to make sure I understand. So um, where we really come in is early on in like the invention life cycle, if you right. will, um, before you actually even write up the patent. Right. And so we want to help, you know, find any red flags of, hey, look, there's stuff out there already uh, that is probably going to prevent this from going through. Right. And so that's really where we come in. Now, that being said, if there is something that comes up once the patent is written, right now that's not a space that we're in because we're just focused on this right. sweet spot that we found where before you even go to the attorney, that is something we could transition to as we kind of build down the, the IP pipeline. Um, but we want to make sure we find those red flags before you even write the patent. Right. But it seems like the, the software is interactive. It requires the interaction between you and the computer and the, and yeah, the, so, the inventor. So, so could the inventor go and use your software on his or her own? So that user journey that I described before yeah. is actually optional. Um, okay. So a lot of times these companies have a lot of fires to put out at the same time. And so they're like, we don't want to really spend any time on this, just give us these reports. Right. right? And so that user journey is entirely optional. What we do is really kind of give you the, the reports to actually... Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question about the uh, uh, so you are an inventor yourself, and now you have this uh, a different company. So if you want to, if you have ideas similar to what your original invention was, uh, will you be able to check it on this on your product that whether it's patentable or it infringes on it? With um, which I'm sorry, I just want to make sure Suppose you, you have the brain sensor. Yeah. Okay. So suppose you think of a different brain sensor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Or use the same sense in a different part of the body, maybe on the spinal cord. Okay. So, would you be able to find out whether it infringes on your previous patent or not? Yeah, ultimately that's that's definitely what this would find, right? So if there was a company, right now we're focused on companies and not like individual inventors or you yeah, know, things like that. But, thing, yeah. but let's say we worked with a medical device company that exactly. had a brain sensor. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. That would run through our system and we would show kind of what's out there in prior art that, that has those. Can you tell me if you have any competition in this space? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I may have actually included a, a couple slides. So um, here are some of the competitors that are out there. Um, there are companies focused on kind of basic idea submission, companies focused on later stage patent analysis. Um, so there are companies like, for example, PadSnap and Anography, uh, which are more for large enterprises. So right now, they are working with like the, the IBMs, the Googles, and so forth, uh, where their contracts are like $75,000 annually. Uh, so their focus is like data visualization of, of IP and so forth. And then there's companies like Spigot and Bright Idea, which are also large enterprise based, but they're focused on kind of just, you put an idea, you can like vote it up, vote it down, things like that, like crowdsourced innovation, basically. So we see ourselves kind of sitting in between those two. Um, but I think a better way to kind of talk about this is, is where we actually sit, again, in that invention life cycle. So uh, in terms of when you kind of come up with the idea, I think we've really found a sweet spot of, as you're really developing that concept, before you spend a lot of time and money into the R&D, is where we differentiate ourselves from our competitors. Uh, now, that being said, there are also new types of law firms popping up uh, in the Bay Area, uh, like Cognition IP and Atrium. So these firms are starting as tech-enabled from the ground up, and by that I mean there's a patent attorney and then a, a machine learning or AI person that starts the law firm together, uh, and so they're they're actively uh, you know trying to automate a lot of the processes and kind of disrupt what regular law firms are doing. So those are definitely competitors as well, but you know the way I see ourselves fitting in with them is we actually were talking with uh, someone at Y Combinator and, and they felt that our fit was, you know, when Amazon bought Whole Foods, a lot of grocery stores were very concerned of how could they keep up with, you know, the technology that, you know, this, this joint partnership would have. And Instacart allowed regular grocery stores to be tech enabled. And I think that's where I see Inventor fitting in, where we can help regular law firms as we've already started those partnerships in helping them be tech enabled in a simpler fashion. 
So I work with inventors also in Washington, a lot of the universities. Um, so are you, are you really in the process of trying to make a company that they support? Uh, are you basically doing preliminary research? Yeah, you could see this as a, a prior art landscape, kind of a, a lot of that rolled into one. And what, what's your relationship with the USPTO? You yeah, with the USPTO, we are helping their patent pro bono program. So right now, uh, we are helping the Midwest region through GVMS, or Gateway Venture Metric Services. Um, and so we are helping their clients uh, as part of the pro bono program. So, for example, the way the system worked before we were helping was clients would come through GVMS and then um, they would send them to the WashU IP Law Clinic where students would practice writing patentability opinions uh, and then those would go to the network of attorneys. We're coming in at the front end of that system. So the clients, uh, after they go to GVMS, they come to us. And so our reports help essentially perform triage. So if it's a low score, it actually goes straight back to the inventor. Uh, with an explanation of here's the results and here's probably why it won't go through. If it's a really high score, it goes straight to the attorney. And if it's a medium score, it goes to the Wash UIP law students where they can continue practice writing that for you. How do you get paid? So the companies that uh, are buying these reports is how we generate that revenue. So the, the customers that we have uh, here, uh, on this, on the right side over there, are the ones that are currently paying us. Okay, so it's the law firms, but, so little inventors who are just starting out, they pay, do you have a sliding scale for people, or is it one price for So, family? so right now we're just focused mostly on companies. The law, Lewis Rice was one of our first customers, but law firms are a little hard to get traction with right now, and we've gotten more traction with companies. Um, so we're focused on companies right now. Um, of course, if an inventor wants help, we would never turn them down, but we're not really focused on uh, marketing towards those inventors right now. A lot of people can have the same concepts. How deep do you go into determining whether or not what makes a difference between their concept and this person's concept, and is that patentable? Yeah, so um, in that earlier slide where I kind of talked about the light bulb, where it was a thin filament that, or it's, you heat a thin filament that produces light, or you use electricity, I'm sorry, you heat a thin filament that produces light. What we do is we really break that down into separate components, and we see what's out there that incorporates all of those components or some of those components of your invention. Um, and oftentimes there are always patents out there that incorporate some of them. So ultimately it's a question of what all is out there that incorporates maybe all of what you're doing or some of what you're doing and so forth. And it's, and it's really showing you that. So a lot of these companies get you know pretty immediate insight into um, if they should even pursue a space because, for example, one med device company that we worked with uh, did five reports with us where they had a core technology and they were looking at five different applications. Um, and so they used our reports to help them make that decision of, okay, well this one technology has the least amount of clearance, you know, Boston Scientific and Medtronic are already here. We're probably not going to have a, a, an easy time getting here. Whereas this one has a lot of clearance. So this is the path we should pursue. So your, your reports are going to catch not only the prior art, but the, what is actually patentable, the novel level, you know, the, the novelness of it, the things that are patentable and aren't patentable, you know, those, so all of that feeds into the... Yeah, so into the score is like a breakdown of how similar it is, the assignees that are out there, the citations, uh, the prior art that exists, the priority day to know if like are things active or not, and so forth. Can you talk a little bit about? I know you mentioned that the um, phone call sort of back and forth that comes initially is an optional um, experience to have. But is that are you finding that the customers that you have are taking advantage of that for the most part? And then if so, how does that scale um, in your um, you know in that process? Because is you hiring yeah. have people answering phones, or do you see that sort of like? just for the low-hanging fruit and once the attraction that's not unnecessary. Right, right. Uh, so the phone call part is uh, actually <laughs> currently not the optional part, but the user journey okay. uh, is optional. But uh, that's definitely something where we see going away over time because that will be entirely automated. And that's part of the reason we're doing that phone call is because 
no one's really captured that translation piece before, right? We've learned a lot from these kind of phone calls. Uh, for example, we had uh, you know one uh, customer we were working with where they had initially talked about a wireless device, but what was also really unique about what they were doing was that it was portable. And that was something that, you know, sometimes you might think of those two words being related, but those are little data points that we're continuing to gather, such that when this is automated over time, it's backed by, you know, tens of thousands of human verified data points. Now, that being said, we are starting to ask ourselves the question, well, when can this be fully automated? And that's something we're testing out today. Um, of seeing, okay, how close are we to actually being able to fully automate this? So, I always end up asking the algorithm questions, so I apologize. Um, <laughs> so one thing, I know you've rolled this out pretty quickly, one thing to keep in mind, make sure you're, or, or eventually, if you haven't done it already, be able to handle the images, okay? Because I work in pharmaceuticals, and a lot of times it's, Disclosure with obfuscation. That's what the pattern does, right? So your claims are at this level, and the secret sauce is actually buried in a figure. So make sure you process those. A lot of times you just miss like the crucial chemical structure or some ingredient that's buried in the figure somewhere. Yeah, and in terms of even just image processing, there are really big machine learning problems out there that are still unsolved. Um, and I honestly think that just that alone could be a company of its own. So that's something we don't want to get too focused on yet. Uh, we want to make sure that we're getting this, this part down, but I absolutely agree that images are incredibly important. Uh, something that we you know, hope to focus on when we have the additional resources to do that. So your website, inventor.co, is a website. You don't have apps at this point. You plan to go to apps. And it sounds like then you've got some kind of back end that does the AI and machine learning. Uh, I've read something recently where it sounds like Amazon is going out there and if you have something on their site, I don't doubt any of the other cloud providers, they're watching it and pretty soon they come up with a knockoff. Are you considering that and how are you going to handle that if they're, if they're out there scavenging? Yeah, I'm sorry, wait, could you uh, repeat that last part one more time? The, uh, if Amazon is out there and you have your app on Amazon that's doing your proprietary stuff, and Amazon says, okay, we watch it for a while, they don't say it, but they do it, according to, uh, I don't know, something I read in Wire or somewhere. And they're watching it, and then all of a sudden, they've come up with a duplicate, and now they're eating your lunch. And have you considered that or even heard about that? Um, so, uh, we've definitely considered the, the thought of what happens if a bigger, better funded company wants to pursue something like this. Uh, I think the value of the human verification component that we've added is that it requires manual collection of data points. That's not something a better algorithm can solve, ultimately. AI is great, AI plus humans is always better. And so we see ourselves by the more data points that we're collecting, the further ahead we are than anyone that starts today. And so that's how we uh, see ourselves being defensible from you know, a company like Amazon or Google who's, who's better funded. But the second point, uh, I think what you're referring to, I think it's cybersecurity is an incredibly important aspect of what we're doing, right? Because we're taking confidential information and ideas and so forth. And so that's something we're monitoring very closely uh, using NIST standards, and kind of the gold standards for, for cybersecurity. Any questions? Thank you so much. Thank you.